I've been through this process a lot of times. Uh, I haven't always gotten it right. But what I've learned in my life is that one 10 bagger, uh, amortizes a whole bunch of 20 or 30% mistakes and leaves room left over and that you enjoy the very comfortable lifestyle that I've enjoyed. Uh, and I think that that possibility exists, frankly, with all three names. Rick, what is going on? Really good to see you. Uh, Andy, it's nice to be back on your show. Thank you for having me back. Uh, I'm just back from vacation, so I'm rested and tanned and ready to go. Ready to go. You know, I was thinking about this actually right before you came on. It seems like you had a great vacation, but it's almost you're one of those people that never retires or rarely vacations. <laughs> is that true? I've lived an extremely good life, Andy. I need to acknowledge that. I failed retirement completely. And the reason that I failed retirement is because if you define work as an unpleasant task that you do to make a living, I haven't worked since 1988. Uh, I have been able to focus on things that at once afforded me a great material circumstance, but more importantly, were very, very interesting. Uh, and, and the idea that I would quit doing something that I enjoyed uh, and that I spent my lifetime learning how to do because I reached a certain age seemed stupid to me. Uh, so I did retire from overly regulated activities. I retired from having a securities license. I retired from running a public company. I re retired as much as I could from answering to securities regulators around the world. <laughs> but I, uh, I kept doing the things I enjoyed, which were securities analysis, investing, and education, communicating with ordinary investors on a global basis. Well, in that sense, I hope you never retire because I enjoy spending time with you and seeing you. Thank you. You're welcome. So last time we talked, this was back in July. We met in person at your conference, which was fantastic, by the way. My lovely wife, who you met, had such a great time. To all those out there, don't miss it next year and definitely hit the cruise. It's fantastic. But we talked about, and I had you on right before then, we talked about the sweet spot of investing. You mentioned we were in the sweet spot of investing for gold and silver companies specifically because the underlying asset had appreciated so much that the stocks had either had not moved or had not moved up proportionately. Where are we with all of that, specifically with gold and silver stocks, mining stocks? I, I would argue that we're in the same place. The gold and silver stocks have moved up, but the gold and silver prices have moved too. <laughs> You'll recall in that, sir, in that discussion, I said to you that if past was prologue, that the high quality companies would move first, which they've done. Uh, you will recall too, that I said for the move in the equities to get going in earnest, the companies needed to begin to report stronger quarterly earnings. They needed to be able to demonstrate margin expansion with price acceleration. Last year, a lot of the price uh, increase that we saw in gold and silver was used up by increases in the price of inputs to produce gold and silver which is to say the operating margins in the industry didn't increase as much as people thought they would because the cost, particularly energy, labor, and tax, increased so much. In the reporting season that's coming up in the next four weeks, my suspicion is that you're going to see upside surprises, but particularly in companies like Agnico, Eagle. That's not a securities recommendation, by the way. But I think that you're going to see upside, upside surprises in earnings. And my suspicion is that that will be rewarded in those companies, uh, probably very quickly, uh, with increases in the equity prices. This likely won't spread to the broad market, the broad, uh, gold market, uh, for two or three quarters. But we are definitely on the run. Uh, we're on the runway both because margins are increasing, but we're also on the runway because mergers and acquisition, which is something else we talked about, is getting underway in earnest. Uh, so I, I think we continue to be in that same sweet spot. 
Riff, that is music to my ears. <laughs> and it's almost, for those listening and watching and viewing, you have not by any means missed the boat. This is, please interrupt if I'm wrong, this is still a great time to accumulate great quality names across the board, whether they're majors, mid-tier producers, or even junior explorers. Am I correct about that? It's important that you focus on the phrase, high quality companies. If you invest in the sector, the entire sector, particularly in the juniors, you will go broke, guaranteed. If you invest in the highest quality companies in the sector, during periods of time when the sector is out of favor, you will do extraordinarily well. Uh, but it's important that when you talk about investing in the gold sector, that you aren't talking about consolidated moose pasture mines or amalgamated orangutan explorations. Uh, it, it's important that you confine yourself to the top third of producing companies the top quarter of development companies, the top 5% of exploration companies. Within that disclaimer, <laughs> my suspicion is that you will do as well in the next 10 years as you would have done in the decade 2000 to 2010, which was the second best epoch of my investing career. Yeah, well said. Well, and that's, again, music to my ears. <laughs> I'm very much... Looking forward to that. So let's talk about two things I want to talk about. Let's talk about some quality names that I think are quality, and I'd like to get your feedback on that. And then um, I want to poke around just a little bit. I know that you hate, I mean, I should, no, let me say this correct. You love hated assets. Right. We did talk about that a bit um, previously. So I want to say if that is still your, your radar. What assets do you currently love because they're hated? But let's start with some companies first here that are on my radar. They were at your show, Luca Mining out of Mexico. Tell me about them in your opinion. Uh, I just invested in Luca. Uh, I had a small position in Luca before the conference. Uh, I, I got to visit with them extensively at the conference. And the consequence of that is in their recent financing, you know, I bought a half a million bucks for the stock or something like that. Uh, let's start with what I don't like about Luca. Uh, let's talk with a downside. Um, the political and social outlook in Mexico around mine, uh, I believe continues to deteriorate. So you will have social challenges in, Me in West Mexico around the narcotraficantes. It's important that you deal with those social challenges with a Mexican, which Luca has. Uh, and somebody who has cultural familiarity with the regions that he or she operates in. And, and there are political problems at the center. Uh, again, you have to deal with that with a Mexican. The good news is that uh, those same problems will make assets come available for sale by people who can't operate in that environment. And a Mexican business person, like the people who run Luca, will have a competitive advantage over the next five years displacing gringos from the Mexican environment. The second problem with Luca is that currently they operate two small mines. I don't like small mines. I like big mines. Everything that can go wrong with a big mine can go wrong with a small mine, but a small mine can never make you big money. I happen to believe that one of Luca's two small mines in Guerrero, Campo Morado, has the ability to become a big mine. It hasn't happened yet. But I think that the geological prospectivity of it is substantial and can happen. But I own Luca because I believe over the next five years, they will be consolidators in the Mexican mining space. As North American and European investors consign Mexico to the too tough category. But you can't have an aggregation of mineralized assets like Mexico and define it as too tough if you want to be in the mining business. And I believe that the young entrepreneur at Luca is precisely the type of person who can operate domestically in Mexico in that political and social context, but in a broader plane too, uh, because of his sophistication and familiarity with North American capital markets. I'm particularly attracted with the fact that he's building the company uh, around a core 
of uh, executives who he recruited from the Lundini, the Lundin um, empire. These are people who I've known for 30 or 35 years. I've watched them build companies systematically for three decades. The game plan that Luca has is precisely the game plan uh, which was used to build Lundin Mining. I've watched it work before. I've watched these people work it before. And I like the fact that Luca is focused on implementing this game plan in Mexico. Uh, as you say, I love hate. And the mining community hates Mexico. The challenges are evident to me, but there are world-class assets. There's world-class inventory. There's world-class expertise, and there's world-class labor. If you look at who operates American mines, if you look who's underground, they're Mexican. Uh, so I'm very attracted to Luca, but I understand. <laughs> yes, also I want to bring up too, this was, I don't know if you remember this, but this has been, this has been a while. You told me jurisdictions doesn't so much scare you. There is concern, but doesn't scare you as long as you are justly compensated to correct. Correct. And in your opinion, Luca has the potential for this. As long as you say potential. In both cases, they're restarting two mines. Uh, in both cases, they need to demonstrate that they have the operating competence uh, as a consequence of recapitalization to do this. I've watched this game plan work in Mexico with First Majestic. Not to say that First Majestic hasn't stubbed their toes, but they have bought assets that were starved for cash, uh, added back cash, uh, added back management focus, and turned around assets that the market had believed were way, way, way past their prime. And, and taken the company, in that case, from you know 35 cents to as high as $15. Uh, I watched Luca having the opportunity to take two assets, which I believe are good assets that were starved for cash, uh, adding back the capital, uh, uh, you know, capital to these assets and, and focusing management time and attention on them. And then using that as a building block to do it again and again and again. I watched this happen with Lendi, uh, and I was richly rewarded and I hope to be richly rewarded again. Excellent. Let's move on to another company. Um, I met this company as well at your conference, Contango Ore. What's uh, stuck up to me was just some of my back history. For those that don't know, I'm originally from Alaska, and that's where Rick was is from. And that's where they're mining. What surprised me about them is how quickly they got permitted, and I think that's their process and their business, and that they're already producing. Uh, tell me your thoughts and opinions about Contango Ore. Well, Contango War really for me is a play on the CEO who I've known since he was a placer doll. Uh, I've known him for three decades. Uh, truly unique human being. Uh, and he is doing what he does best. He's operated in Alaska for three and a half decades. He lives in Alaska. His wife is Alaskan. Uh, he is uh, operating in exploration and production in Alaska. You know, I like people who have been serially successful, which he has. And I want the success to be focused on the task at hand, which this is. His business plan is one I frankly don't like. Uh, he is taking uh, on uh, very high grade, but very small assets uh, and putting them in production. I like big assets, but the fact that I like it, uh, you know, I never get everything right in the best uh, when he showed me the first asset, the durable competitive advantage here is that his partner, uh, Kim Ross has the Fort Knox mill, which is feed hungry and grade challenged. Uh, he didn't have to build a mill. He didn't have to build infrastructure. Uh, he didn't even have to build, uh, a team around mine production because he got all that with his partner. The pathway to cash flow was very, was very interesting, very easy for me to see. The second asset that he has a uh, lucky shot, I frankly don't like, but he likes it. Uh, and I would suspect that if you had a scale, his expertise in Alaska gold projects and my expertise in Alaska gold projects, 
that his side of the scale would be heavier than mine. In other words, he knows more than me. So I'm willing to accept that, having known him for a fairly long time. The third asset that he took on high gold, I was already a shareholder of. Uh, and while this is a sub million ounce high grade deposit, I think that the exploration potential in the district, which I think uh, Rick is uh, highly qualified to exploit, is very hot. In other words, I see a million ounces and I have a reasonable expectation that, that million ounce becomes two and a half million ounces. Meanwhile, uh, it's on the coast. Uh, and it has the grade that can allow it to overcome, uh, I think the locations around, uh, a fairly remote location. I'm also attracted to the fact that I have had discussions with Rick, both over coffee and over beer, different discussions, uh, <laughs> about the nature of involving, uh, indigenous communities, Alaska native communities, uh, Rick didn't come to this five years ago when it became socially fashionable. Rick talked to me about this 35 years ago when he was at Placer Dome. And, uh, this is a guy who is viscerally involved personally in getting the community, uh, behind and involved in the project. And as you know, being from Alaska, the Alaska native corporations and the, uh, native people in Alaska are critically important in both the social and the political process of Alaska. And I think one of the advantages that Rick, uh, had in terms of permitting the first deposit was the explicit and overt backing of all of the Alaska native corporations, uh, because they dealt with them for three decades, uh, and his involvement of the local community, uh, the indigenous community. In the project, uh, in terms of employment and in terms of their impact, uh, in terms of getting their input on wastewater considerations, aesthetic considerations, major fauna considerations, he, he didn't, he didn't wait to consult the communities until he was in front of the licensing authority. He consulted the communities five years before. So when he went to the licensing authority, he was able to say, I'm proposing this practice because the people who live in the district have asked me to impose this practice. That's very, very, very different than a reactive approach. And I think, uh, I think it's an important skill set around the world, but I think it's a particularly important skill set in Alaska. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, not to interrupt you, but I would agree with you when we were talking, when Rick and I were talking, um, off camera at your conference, we talked about politics, not politic parties, but just bobbing and weaving through, if you would, Alaskan politics and how we handled that and how we got permitted and how he's involved in the local community there, which was fantastic because something you said that I want to pick up, you said there's third project as the hype potential, and we use potential, the word potential, to be a million dollar, a million ounce, pardon me, producer. Is that what you say? And it could be 2 million. Uh, I said that the reserve base was just under a million ounces. Got it. Uh, I think that the reserve potential is closer to two or three. Got it. Time will tell. Yeah. And I think that Rick's focus is putting the million ounces in production before he concerns himself with adding 2 million ounces. I would prefer his focus was the other way around. Uh, but again, if you put our relative Alaskan skill sets on a scale, uh, he's going to be on the heavier side of the scale than me. And I've known him long enough that I'm prepared to gamble on his rather than my instinct. Got it. Well said. One other company, and then we'll move on, was Integra Resources. They were at your conference as well. I met Jason. Uh, they're in a great jurisdiction in the Idaho um, area. And I want you to comment about that. Um, I've spoken to Jason um, a few times. I had him on the show. Very energetic, but I think we're at his, um, um, expo I guess, I'm most concerned of what he has there in his asset coming on that. Um, 
the idea that you merged Integra and Millennial, I think is critical because you build critical mass. You add uh, the Nevada assets, which can be very easily put in production with the new Florida Canyon asset, which is in production right across the highway. And then for the upside, you have the Idaho asset. You also uh, have that wonderful conjunction of a management team of my vintage, again, from Placer Dome, who has done it before in a junior basis, you know, built a, built a, built a junior mining company into a producer and sold it with the younger generation, Jason, that has legs. So from a human aspect, I, I think you have a really unique set of opportunities. In terms of the physical assets, uh, the purchase of the old Argonaut asset, uh, Florida Canyon, means that they have existing production, which is important. Uh, they have a, a mine fleet, they have free cash flow, they have a labor inventory. Importantly, they have a love lock. It's important because the two undeveloped assets, uh, which they are looking forward to putting in production, are both at love lock. And as you transition out of production of Florida Canyon, uh, into production at Hasbrook and Three Hills, uh, you have the same labor force, uh, you have the same management skill set, uh, you have the same local relationships. I mean, there are real synergies uh, developing new mines in the shadow of the head frames of old mines. And that's precisely what you're doing. And you're not changing the mining method. These are open pit oxide heat leach deposits. Uh, which I really like. The upside uh, is a deposit that I was always skeptical about, Delamar, which is why I went there personally. Uh, I had a difficult time believing that Kim Ross would shut that project down and incur the reclamation liability if there was an awful lot of, awful lot of rock left. The point that was made to me by George Salamis, who I've known for a very long time and have a very high regards for, also from the old Placer Dome Mafia like Rick, uh, is that they had no more rock there at $300 gold. But they had a lot of rock left at $2,500 gold. Again, I was skeptical. I've probably heard that a thousand times in my career. Sure. So I flew to Reno. I drove out to Love Lock. I looked at those operations. Uh, I drove up to Delamar in Idaho, and I had a look at Delamar. Uh, I was able to go in the core shack. Uh, and look at the mineralized material section by section by section. But mercifully, uh, uh, in the company of some pretty good geologists, put this isolated core in the context of cross sections and, and came away thinking, you know what? At $2,500 gold, I was wrong. They're right. Now, understand that they have monumental tasks in front of them. They have to maintain Florida Canyon with a fairly limited remaining lifespan, use the free cash flow and use the people from that to develop Hasbrook and Three Hills. Uh, they have to permit those. Uh, they have to finance those. They have to build them while at the same time uh, keeping their eyes on the real prize, which is Delamar. Resort. Somebody who gets involved in Integra uh, probably has to have a five-year time frame. And, and they have to believe that the company can simultaneously overcome four challenges. And they have to understand that the management team is going to be opportunistic. If there is another acquisition opportunity in the basin and range, either in Idaho or in Nevada, and I know the one in, I in Nevada that they're looking at, they will acquire it. In other words, they'll go from four challenges to five. Um, Given the unique skill sets and the unique asset uh, package that they have and the applicability of their skill sets to the asset package that they have, if they accomplish all of those things correctly over five years, I think you have the potential for a 10 bag. Cool. Uh, and I like that. I I'm not saying it's going to happen. And I, I want to, I want your audience to understand that between now and the time that they potentially enjoy the 10 bagger, 
they could experience a 30 or 40 or 50% share price decline. Uh, you can have volatility in a stock like any of these three stocks. These stocks can go up or down 10% or 15% in a week for almost no reason whatsoever. Right. If an institutional shareholder gets redemptions and they have to sell, irrespective of the quality of the assets, the stocks will go down. Um, uh, so people who own them, who hear me say, you could have a 10 bag, need to understand that this 10 bagger isn't going to happen in calendar 24, right? You're not going to, you're not going to be able to come off this stock over a long weekend and experience these gains. You're going to have to suffer through volatility. You're going to have to experience real risk. And, and the management team is going to have to overcome four or five challenges. But mercifully, at age 71, I've been through this process a lot of times. Uh, I haven't always gotten it right. But what I've learned in my life is that one 10-bagger uh, amortizes a whole bunch of 20 or 30% mistakes and leaves room left over to enjoy the very comfortable lifestyle that I've enjoyed. Uh, and I think that that possibility exists, frankly, with all three names. Excellent. Let's uh, move on you know, quickly. And I hate, I'd love, like to talk more about this, but I don't want, I don't want to spend too much time just for time's sake. Talk about some hated assets, not specific companies, but sectors that you are really starting to pay attention to because they're hated. Uh, it too bad this discussion didn't take place 10 days ago because the asset that I used to hate when everybody else loved it, that everybody hates today is lithium. Yeah. But the takeover by RTZ, uh, Rio Tinto, uh, of the Canadian assets for a 90% premium <clears throat> has suddenly added some luster to the lithium. I suspect that the lithium market has more hate to come. Uh, lithium was the flavor of the month for almost a decade. We never had a shortage of primary lithium. We had a shortage of lithium processing capacity. The consequence of that is that the lithium price went up sevenfold, the, the price of lithium chemicals, despite the fact that we had no shortage at all of elemental lithium. Billions of dollars were spent looking for lithium because we never looked for it before. A lot of it got found, way too much. And meanwhile, over the last seven years, the shortage of processing capacity got addressed. So the lithium price, having gone up sevenfold, fell by 75%, which means that almost all of the new lithium dis discoveries that were made are uneconomic and will remain uneconomic. The market that bid these things up to stupid prices is selling them in an equally indiscriminatory fashion, not paying any attention to, in movie parlance, the good, the bad, or the ugly. The good will be thrown out with the bad and the ugly. Uh, and this, I think, over the next two years, will be the best single opportunity in the mining space. Before this takeover, uh, lithium was becoming as unloved, or rather as hated, as uranium was in 2021. Uh, so I would say... Uh, that that's a sector that I'm particularly focused on. I'm, I'm looking at all the lithium assets in the world that I can and trying to rank them uh, because I see them all being sold. Uh, and I see very few suitors of the ilk of Rio Tinto. Uh, the second sector that I really like, well, there's, there's so many sectors that are hated. Oil and gas is hated. Mm -hmm. The best single extractive industry in the world is oil and gas, the single best business in the world. In the mining business, we return for, ca we, we pray for return of capital employed. And in the oil and gas business, they talk about return on capital employed. That's a much better discussion. So for investors with a time, five to 10 year time frame, you look at the best possible businesses that you can, mm -hmm. particularly when they're out of favor. And oil and gas, despite the fact that it's recovered substantially since 2001, is still very out of favor. 
the investment community is acting like the politicians are right. Uh, never happened before. I don't know why it'll happen again. Uh, and they're suggesting that peak oil demand occurs in 2030 or 2032, which means on a net present value calculation, your free cash flows begin to decline in six years. I believe that peak oil demand occurs in 2060 or 2065. So I add back the second half of the decline curve, which gives me very different valuations than the valuations that are occurring to the big thinkers. And I believe that I'm right and that they're wrong. I believe that my knowledge of resource economics is superior to Angela Merkel's and Joe Biden's and Justin Trudeau's. Um, they do what they do. I do what I do. And I think in this circumstance, I'm right. You have a business that at today's uh, energy prices is coining money. And you have a circumstance where despite the fact that it's coining money, the industry as a whole, including state supported firms is under investing in productive capacity to the tune of over a billion dollars a day. When this lack of investment in a capital intensive business begins to impair these companies ability to produce, we will have shortages. And we will have shortages into an industry where demand is increasing, not declining. Will this occur in a year or two years or three years? I don't know. I don't care. Particularly for somebody your age, Andy, uh, what happens five years from now and 10 years from now is critically important. Probably less important for me at age 71, but I can't help but think that way. And so I'm really attracted to the oil and gas business. I'm particularly attracted to the natural gas business, the North American natural gas business, which is really hated. Yeah. Uh, gas prices are very low because it's being produced as a byproduct of oil drilling, particularly in the Permian Basin. I would suspect that absent the development of new technologies, yeah. the Permian production uh, has peaked. Not demand, but production. Uh, and I suspect it'll taper off. That's where the world surplus is coming from. Right now, natural gas prices at Henry Hub uh, are approximately a dollar and fifty per million BTU uh, of energy. That same gas landed in Tokyo, Shanghai, or Rotterdam goes for about eight dollars a million BTU, and it takes about a buck and a half to get it from Henry Hub to Rotterdam. I mean, there's seven dollars a BT. Uh, pardon me, uh, five and a half dollars a BTU in arbitrage. Now right. there are billions of dollars being spent right now on that arbitrage. Gas gathering, gas processing, gas liquefaction, gas deliquefaction, gas transportation, and the reshoring of European businesses that use natural gas, like fertilizer and chemicals, to the U.S. Gulf Coast. This arbit this this delta will be arbitraged away over the next five years, and it's there to capture. Yeah. And the circumstance in Canada is more extreme. Uh, Inexplicably, the guy who runs Canada believes that there's no business case for selling dollar and a half Canadian natural gas for eight euros in Rotterdam. Um, I'm not saying that, that the Canadians in the next election will thank and excuse him. What I'm trying to say is, uh, despite his lack of proclivity with math, he is not as big as the market is. And the market will resolve the problem over time. So I think the uh, a really, really, really hated opportunity opportunity with lots of upside over five years, not five months, over five years is North American natural gas. The third opportunity that I would point you to, there's a lot of them. Uh, if you look for hate, there's a lot of it in the resource market. Uh, sulfide nickels. This is a bit more challenging. Uh, because the supply side around nickel laterites in Indonesia is increasing and, and they are lower cost. But the environmental degradation that's occurring was a conju in conjunction with developing those deposits, I believe will cause the cost curve on the lateritic nickels to increase. Meanwhile, sulfide production worldwide is being shut in. 
when you see mines being shut down, you're seeing the epitome of hate. Mm -hmm. Somebody who spent a billion dollars opening a mine shuts it down. Uh, never mind, no new investment. You're seeing disinvestment. And yeah. disinvestment is what I love. So sulfide nickels that are in the discovery development phase uh, that aren't trying to produce into a market impacted by the lateritic nickels uh, really attract me, be they in Western Australia, be they in Brazil, uh, those places. And, and I would say that another sector that attracts me that has a lot of hate is platinum group metals. I'm attracted to them because they've fallen substantially in price. Uh, I'm attracted to them because I understand why they fall in price, which is to say the belief among the big thinkers that the internal combustion engine is going the way of the dodo and we won't need catalytic converters, except we will. I don't see any ongoing worldwide demand for smog. Uh, and and so I see that demand continuing. And I see, too, uh, just like in 1990, the last time the platinum and palladium price, prices fell precipitously, that you have a natural seller who will run out of material, and that's Russia. For those who aren't familiar with it, for the last couple of years, the Russians have needed money. Yeah. And when they need money, uh, they sell what they have on the shelf, which is copper, cobalt, nickel, yeah platinum and palladium. The last time in 1992, the Russians ran out of those things to sell. They didn't run out of the need for money. They ran out of stuff to sell. Yeah. And the prices in the ensuing two years doubled across the board. And it's, it can, this is really pretty easy stuff. Uh, it's exacerbated in the case of platinum and palladium because the stuff is only really produced in two and a half places. Russia being one place. South Africa being the second place, and Zimbabwe is the half place because it isn't really a place. Uh, if you look at political and social risk, uh, the social and political risks in Russia are fairly obvious. The place is at war. Um, they're holding the company to get the country together with guns. Uh, South Africa literally between a rock and a hard spot, uh, and Zimbabwe. I don't know how to describe Zimbabwe. Uh, if you had the manifestation of that social or political risk in either of the two principal jurisdictions, Russia or South Africa, and I don't think that's unlikely, uh, any material supply disruption in either of those countries would, I think, see the PGM price double. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying it's even a probability, but it's a large enough possibility that the speculator in me can't resist it, particularly given how hated those assets are. If I could comment about that, and by the way, I'm going to take something you've said in the last 10 minutes, and that's going to be my intro. It was that good. I have, I'm really good friends with a newsletter writer that's been doing this for 25 years, small, but he has a core group of uh, audience and people. And he made the comment that, and I paraphrase, similar to what you have said. Andy, I don't understand it when things are low and hated. No one wants them. That's when we should, he does understand it, but that's when we should be buying. And when things are screaming going up, I sell a bunch of subscriptions. I, and that's when I shouldn't be selling subscriptions. <laughs> it's supposed to be true. Going back in history, uh, Bob Bishop, who was a very successful newsletter writer in the eighties and nineties, yeah. uh, said at my conference, um, my subscriptions are the most in demand when I have the least value to offer. Yes. And my su subscriptions are, uh, the least wanted when I have the most to offer. <laughs> uh, uh, understanding that, uh, really has been the key of my investing success beginning at about age 30. In my twenties, uh, I needed the price action of the commodity to demonstrate that the thesis was true. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is after you've achieved the price, the, the price action, the thesis is no longer true. <laughs> Let's, uh, talk about this. One of your favorite topics is tier one assets. We've discussed this in the past. If we could revisit that 
just real quick for people that missed that talk, that discussion about why you like tier one off his assets. It's almost a rhetorical question, but I'd like to discuss that. Um, just briefly, how do you look for them? And then, um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll go through them. Let's define tier one assets first. Yes. Uh, a minimum of 10 billion U.S. dollars in recoverable reserves and resources at current commodity prices. With the ability once in production to generate at least a billion dollars a year in sales revenue. With uh, all in sustaining costs, not total costs, but all in sustaining costs in the bottom quartile for its commodity on a global basis and return on capital employed in the best quartile in its commodity worldwide. Now, my preference is not for $10 billion deposits. My preference is for 30 billion or 40 billion or 50 billion dollar deposits, but you don't always get what you prefer. Um, I've learned in my life, sadly, Andy, and we alluded to it earlier in the interview that everything that can go wrong with a small mind can go with a, can go wrong with a big mind, but only a big mind can make you big money and a big mind can survive the mistake because it has the reserve life to come back and make you whole. Very long reserve lives, which you have in big mines, mean that if your commodity forecast, price forecast is wrong by a couple of years, you have enough mine life left that you can amortize that two or three year time mistake over a 25 or 30 year remaining mine life. And finally, 50 years of experience, which is sadly now what I have in this business, uh, teaches me that all deposits yield surprises. And in big deposits, the, the surprises are almost always good. And in small deposits, the surprises are often bad. Big deposits give you leverage to exploration upside. They give you leverage to commodity price. They give you the scale to lower your operating costs by increasing the capital expense and amortizing it over more years of production. Great big mining companies fight a continual fight against depletion, against the deterioration of their asset by production. To remain in business, they have to buy tier one deposits. They have to buy 20 year assets or 30 year assets or 40 year assets. So if you are lucky enough to participate in the discovery of one of these assets or the development of one of these assets, one of two things, good things happen. You decapitalize the asset over 30 or 40 years with very high dividends, or you get taken over. The, the market pays you now, or it pays you later. So we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about investing in these deposits. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about investing in the highest quality mining companies of the world. The Rios, the BHPs, the Glencores, the Cameco's. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about return on capital employed, uh, uh, the allocation of capital buying these companies when they're out of favor and then enjoying 10 years of increasing free cash flow. Uh, and, and it's important to make it bores me uh, until they look back at the impact of compounding on their lifestyle, uh, at which time it becomes fascinating. And we're going to talk about how to... Uh, evaluate discoveries in terms of their potential to become tier one mm -hmm. and how to watch the development process through the preliminary economic assessment, the pre-feasibility study, the bankable feasibility study, the construction finance, uh, how to determine whether these deposits are undervalued or overvalued or fairly valued, uh, how to understand the impact of time on your investment. 
you need to understand as an example, when you look at a pre-feasibility study and the pre-feasibility study suggests that the deposit has a net asset value of $2 billion, but the company only has a market capitalization of $350 million. That seems really, really, really cheap. You need to understand what the discrepancy is. What are the permitting hurdles? Because the pre-feasibility study assumes it's permitted. What are the financing hurdles? Because the pre-feasibility study assumes it's financed. How much equity needs to be raised? How will they raise the equity? But most importantly, the time value of money. The pre-feasibility study assumes a net present value post-construction. How long will you have to own the company before you can begin the net present value calculation? If you own the company for 10 years before the net present value calculation kicks in, almost all of the net present value is taken away by the time value of money. So those are the discussions we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about uh, two one deposits in the development stage in commodities that are out of favor, where we believe that commodity price upside and the return of the commodity to favor gives us the opportunity over five years to experience tenfold appreciation in deposits that have already exhibited the hallmarks of tier one deposits. We're going to talk about commodities with more favorable outlooks too. We're going to talk about uranium deposits if the market wants to hear about it. We're going to talk about gold deposits if the market wants to hear about it. But we're going to be talking about nickel deposits, rare earth deposits, uh, platinum and palladium deposits, uh, deposits that have absolutely, that have great tier one potential that are depressed because the market hates the commodity, uh, where we think that the hate goes away and we think that the commodity rebounds too. I need to tell you, this is going to be seven or eight hours. Uh, I don't know if you've been to our boot camp, Sandy, but they are not for tourists. Uh, if you are coming for entertainment, don't come. We are going to give you more material than you can absorb in seven or eight hours. We're going to give you access to the recordings, which you're going to need to familiarize yourself with. You're going to need to take this course two or three times to get all the material that we're going to give you. So if you aren't seriously interested in the information, uh, if you weren't seriously in, uh, interested in investing and speculating in tier one deposits, don't come. If you are interested, this is a chance to spend 99 US dollars and eight hours of your life to materially improve your investment performance for the rest of your life. If you don't think that you got your money's worth for any reason whatsoever, email me and I'll give you the tuition. I have a gold-plated money-back guarantee that's been in place for 28 years in investing products. Uh, and, and Andy, I need to cut it off because I need to be in another phone call uh, in one minute, but it takes me longer than that to get smart for the next call. No problem. When is the conference? The conference is this Saturday. I'll put that in the show notes. So Please do. Rick, we're going to go. Uh, thank you so much for your mentorship for, throughout all the years. You've been a mentor of mine from afar. It's great to get to know you in person. you got to go, but thank you, thank you, thank you, Rick. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Bye.